am Ellie the chef. I am an Epicurean explorer, and I love to play with ingredients and tastes, techniques and cuisines. And it's always an exercise in wild experimentation. Years ago, when I wanted to learn how to bake bread, I called my dad and I asked him for his bread recipe, and he said, milk, yeast, gluten, fructose, fat, and a pinch of salt, maybe an egg. I said, you know, thanks, Dad. Can you give me a little bit more direction? What types, what quantities, what order? And he said, no, figure it out. <laughs> and so I did, and I spent many trying Saturday afternoons playing with various bread recipes. And I had so much fun doing it that I've since applied a similar technique to understanding pies and pastries and jams and jellies and pastas and lasagnas and ice creams. <laughs> Ellie the chef has also become my online persona and a metaphor for who I am professionally. I like to play with the raw ingredients of innovation and technology, creativity and design, entrepreneurship and leadership, in order to engineer the solutions that I think will transform this messy world around us. And it is really messy. If you consider this nation alone, 5,000 American schools are considered failing. One in every two African American males between 15 and 24 who has graduated from high school is either unemployed, incarcerated, or dead. 15% of Americans are on food stamps. That means that 15% of Americans make an annual salary of $14,088. That's $270 a week. Obesity, anxiety, depression, abuse, the physical manifestations of our unhappiness are at all-time highs. And when I look around and I see this reality in my community, I don't weep at the injustice. I don't point fingers at political parties. I just get really pissed. <laughs> yeah. Because in my heart of hearts, I am an impatient optimist, and I know that we can be doing better. But doing better requires a different operating model than the one that we've been working with. And so I wanted to share with you today some of the principles that I think will define this new operating model. One, it's about collaborative innovation. We must come together and strive together because no one person holds all the solutions and certainly no lone hero is gonna save the day. Two, we must experiment all the time because together we have the opportunity to design our future, not just make incremental tweaks on the past. And experimentation will help us chart this new territory. Three, it's a user-centric world and we must design for it because it's at this nexus of creativity and design and empathy that wholly new opportunities are going to emerge for us. And four, we must play at the systems level and make systems level thinking sexy because these wicked problems we've got, they're gonna require the coordination of people and solutions across industries, sectors, disciplines, and silos. So. Starting at the very beginning, collaborative innovation is the mantra. Years ago, before I moved to Maine, I worked primarily in emerging markets, Southern Africa, Southeast Asia, Central and Eastern Europe, and Southern Cone. And there were three phrases that I knew in about six different languages. Recito, por favor. Receipt, please. <laughs> Donde está la baño? Where is the bathroom? And mambo, or crazy. Now, the first are pretty self-explanatory. I highly recommend you know these phrases when you go into a new country. <laughs> the third, crazy, came from the same story that I heard in different cities, in different countries, in different continents. And at the time, I was working for this amazing organization, Ashoka. And we scoured the planet looking for entrepreneurs with pattern-changing ideas for transforming the lives of people around them, people primarily living on less than $2 a day. And when I sat down with these entrepreneurs, they would all tell me the same story, that they had a job and a salary and responsibilities and standing, but they saw this opportunity to, and you can fill in the blank, bank the unbanked, educate slum children, provide electricity to the world poor. And they were obsessed and consumed with this idea and they just had to go after it. But their family said they were crazy and their employers said they were crazy and their bankers really thought they were crazy. <laughs> And when they began to hit a whole lot of resistance from the community, they began to think, well, maybe I am crazy, and maybe it's time to give up. But then Ashoka came along and said, you're not crazy, you're a social entrepreneur, and there are thousands of people around the world just like you. 
At Ashoka, we invested financially in these entrepreneurs. We helped them scale their operations. We helped them pass proof of concept. And we helped ease the friction that they felt when they came into conflict with the existing system, the embedded norms that want them to fail. And we helped them find their tribe. Of the services that we provided, this was perhaps the most important because it enabled collaborative innovation. And collaborative innovation is an unparalleled learning and technical opportunity. John Hagel recently described it as individuals and institutions coming together in flexible and emerging relationships where collective performance increases rapidly and new knowledge accumulates over time. One of the more interesting collaborations that we enabled was between entrepreneurs working in food security in the Himalayas and entrepreneurs working in food security in the Andes. Now, no two sets of entrepreneurs face the same set of challenges as it relates to topography and irrigation and product to market distribution and climate as these two sets of entrepreneurs. And by bringing them together, we were able to dramatically accelerate the rollout of their individual solutions. Now, Collaborative innovation also brings with it a very important uh, competitive dynamic. Competition really means to come together and to strive together. And it's this dynamic that's about working with people who are either as good as or as creative of you, if not more so. And for, it's this dynamic that gives you the psychological permission you need to push through these boundaries because ultimately what these entrepreneurs are doing they're creating the solutions that everybody else says is impossible, that everybody else says is crazy. So I ultimately left Ashoka um, so that I could um, stand up innovations in the social financing space. And I fell in love with the vision of two amazing entrepreneurs who are creating an online marketplace that enabled caring individuals in the United States to find and fund important causes in emerging markets. We called it Global Giving, and when we launched, uh, we thought we had this super big coup because James Fallows wrote about us in the Atlantic magazine, and he referred to us as the eBay for international aid and philanthropy. And suddenly, all the uber cool technology rags were writing about us, Fast Company and Wired Magazine and uh, Red Herring, but um, they didn't bring with them any donors. <laughs> and um, so we had to you know, turn instead to some pretty traditional um, marketing techniques. We optimized the ability for search engines to find us, we bought Google AdWords, we embedded our product within existing groups of uh, qualified donors, but growth was painfully slow. It was this classic example of build it and nobody will come. <laughs> And um, so there was this moment where we had to recognize that failure was a, a possibility. And you know, we're all smart people, so we got failure. We got, you know, it's important to the learning process. And <laughs> failure can be generative. Many great ideas come out of failure. And if you're not failing, you're not trying. <laughs> <laughs> it just wasn't really an option. So um, <laughs> we turned instead to rapid experimentation. We started to experiment. We learned how to experiment and to experiment all the time. Now, my team was on the back end operations. We worked specifically with entrepreneurs. And um, we launched an experiment that we call supply driven demand. And it was predicated on the notion that the entrepreneurs we were supporting already had groups of supporters who could be incented to use our platform. And so we offered up a small amount of matching capital. and. Um, but we encouraged our entrepreneurs to use our platform. Now, this ended up having a profound impact on the, on the supporters. It turned them into wild evangelists because they found in our platform not just the ability to you know, more easily support organizations they already know and care about, um, but to share their passion and love for these organizations with their friends and their families and with their friends and their families network. It transitioned them from just being part of a social network to being part of a purposeful network in which people were coming together and acting together in really meaningful ways. For global giving, it had a 30 to 1 return in terms of volume. And it transitioned our business model from one that was donor-centric to one that was entrepreneur-centric. And this wasn't just about us finding our secret sauce. It was actually about the emergence of a whole new market category. Global giving became one of a rapidly emerging field of crowdfunding or social capital platforms. And these platforms are really important because right now it means that entrepreneurs who couldn't pass muster with traditional angel investors or venture capitalists are getting funded. Crowdfunding means better fit funding because they rely on investors who already know and trust the entrepreneur. And people-powered capital means that investors and entrepreneurs are co-creating the products and services that they want in this world, the products and services that they're really passionate about. 
Now, this ecosystem has become increasingly important as the debate around economic development and entrepreneurship in this country has become increasingly risk adverse and prescriptive, with investors defining what will make a successful entrepreneur and a successful business case in a fairly narrow way. Through this narrow lens, only a handful of business models are ever going to pass the test. But if we take a user-centric approach and we look at our end user and we package value around them, whole new opportunities are going to emerge to us. Opportunities that we didn't know to look for in the first place. Fast forward a dozen years and I find myself heading up the Maine Women's Fund. And what I brought to the fund was a philosophy that Maine communities will be stronger when women are more fully engaged as economic citizens and as leaders. And looking around to see where we could play with this philosophy, the statistics around women's entrepreneurship were really startling. Women-owned businesses are the fastest growing segment of our national economy. Women are starting businesses at twice the rate of their male counterparts. And these businesses are 33% more capital efficient, which means that they're managing to scale more successfully as they survive that awkward period between startup and ramp up. And I was really excited about this, but when I sat down to talk with women entrepreneurs, I heard a really familiar story. I need capital, but investors think I'm crazy. <laughs> they don't think I've got a strong business case. I've been following various forms of advice, running this way and that way and this way and that way and this way and that way. I think I'm beginning to go crazy. <laughs> I've been at this for so long, it might be time for me to give up. Now, there is something crazy, although we could actually reframe it as different, about these entrepreneurs. More often than not, women are looking at the success of their business as inextricably linked to the well-being of their supply chain, their communities, and their employees. And we call this blended value. But for many uh, traditional investors, it can be really hard to understand, and it's perceived as a social enterprise. And when you talk with women entrepreneurs, it's, you know, their passion around the social value that they're going to create is really high. You know, one woman, she was willing to pay a premium on labor so that she could uh, train and employ low-income women. Another woman was adamant that we preserve the integrity of her product by using organic cream from Maine, dairy, uh, Maine, Maine organic dairy farmers. And these women, they can talk about the financial value that they're going to create just as easily as they can talk about the social value. But when I spoke with investors, it was um, far more black and white. This is a cause, it's not a business. Social value, it's a distraction. She doesn't know how she's going to make money. She's not an entrepreneur. This binary way of looking at entrepreneurship, either you're in it to make as much money as you possibly can, or you're not an entrepreneur, is curtailing this country's ability to transform its economy. <laughs> And it's not limited to women-owned businesses, but their inability to attract capital is a telltale sign that we need to become far more expansive in our notions of how we create value. Because despite their rapid emergence of the $36 billion invested by venture capitalists last year, only 5% went to women-owned businesses. And that's twice what it was four years ago. Yeah, and we know the connection between capital and growth. So without this money, we're gonna, um, they're going to fail to grow. So uh, of the women-owned businesses in this country, only 200,000 of them have managed to net more than a million dollars in revenue. Building an innovation economy is so much more than just finding the next high-growth biotech firm. It means that we need to become inclusive and expansive in our notions of how we're going to create value. It means that we need to ju not just um, quantify markets, but we need to empathize with new markets. And if we put the end user and the customer at the, at the center of our, of our conversation, and we understand their patterns and their behaviors and their motivations and their context, and then package value around that, whole new sets of opportunities are going to emerge for us. And yes, we're going to transform their lives for the better. And we're going to create money while we're doing it. These new models, if we hadn't taken this user-centric approach, we won't know how to look for them. And these new models, they're going to be really transformative in nature. This is what brings me uh, to the current leg of my journey. I, I woke up one morning not too long ago with the realization that I could be doing better, that I wasn't doing enough. 
And it was coupled with um, the understanding that the world's problems had become increasingly complex and that um, my own criticism, that our solutions had become increasingly narrow and my own solutions had become increasingly narrow. What the world needed was systems level thinkers and systems level players, people who are willing to play across industries and sectors and disciplines. And I wasn't doing my part. And it was a, it was a painful realization to come to um, because once the self-loathing subsided, <laughs> yeah, fear settled in. And I knew that the path from there to here was going to require an awful lot of change. I had to ask myself what I was willing to risk and what I was willing to give up. I had to ask if I was really ready to go beyond what I'm known for and what I'm good at, what I'm respected for. And once I had that clarity, I had to take a giant leap of faith and start sharing my own crazy intentions and desires with others. Now, I ultimately found my tribe. I found what I was looking for at the Business Innovation Factory, which is a network of collaborators and partners uh, who are committed to transforming our most intractable systems, from energy to entrepreneurship to education to healthcare. We put the end user at the center of the experience, and we, um, we un once we understand their patterns and behaviors and motivations, we experiment rapidly around them. And my role in all of this is as chief market maker. And it's a direct statement about what I will and will not be doing in this world. I will be working with a network of government agencies and private companies and nonprofits and funders in order to bring those successful solutions to market and create wholly new market categories. We will not be making tweaks on what's already out there. We will not be share takers. And so as part of that, um, it's also my job to invite others to come into this messiness with me so that together we can go up this learning curve and design the products and services and systems that we want in this world, the products and services and systems we want for ourselves and our children and our family. And so my questions for all of you today and my invitation is where can you be doing better? And what are you willing to risk in order to do so? Where can you stop debating and just start experimenting? Who do you need to come together with, to strive with and play with? And most importantly, what are you waiting for? Because a decade is a terribly short time to waste. Thank you. <laughs>